Welcome back, everyone, to the official, scientific, indisputable fan ranking of the Fire Emblem franchise. Last time we covered numbers 22 to 11, and today we're diving deep into the top 10. The last part of this list is the most disliked video on my channel, not that anybody knows. And while my solidarity is forever with you silent protesters, I can only imagine the reaction to the top 10. After all, number four will shock you. This, I suppose, is your invitation to be as angry and irrational as you want in the comments section below. As a quick reminder, this list was voted by fans, and this right here is the top 10 Fire Emblem games. As voted by fans, Let's get back to the board. When looking at Fire Emblem Awakening as a whole, and even outside of the Fire Emblem vacuum, it's important to note that it was a much needed and necessary title that the 3DS needed. It's all thanks to the 3DS library having little to no RPGs on its console at the time, and perhaps this was the reason as to why so many people were introduced to the Fire Emblem series, and why the game even blew up in the first place. But not everything about Awakening was well received. In fact, the boomer part of the Fire Emblem fanbase was, yeah, happy that we got a new Fire Emblem game, but not particularly happy with how quote, casual the game felt. Maybe this is why the series is at a solid middle ground between the fans of the Fire Emblem series at number 10 out of the 22 titles on this list. On top of that, there are a few other reasons as to why I think Awakening hits that middle sweet spot for a lot of folks besides the division between the old and new players. The first is the mechanics of the game. Fire Emblem Awakening has a ton of mechanics, a lot of them being callbacks to previous Fire Emblem titles with their own twists to fit this game's narrative or game's mechanical needs. While none of the twists and mechanics were bad, they weren't necessarily the great polished ideas either that we've come to see in previous Fire Emblem titles, making Awakening a sort of jack of all trades, master of none type of deal. This isn't to say that Awakening is completely devoid of unique and original ideas as it introduced the pair up mechanic. While it was completely unbalanced in this title, pair up added a much more visible way of showcasing the importance of support conversations and later titles would also tone down how absurd Parrot was, with Fates bringing back the mechanic, but in a much more balanced way. The second is the deliberate choice in giving characters quirks, all different from one another, to help them stand out from each other. While this gave players great first impressions of each of the characters, when it came to the support conversations, many players found it lacking any real substance bar a few conversations. But because most players have already had a strong initial impression of the cast, the support conversations could afford to be about four pies, or having their entire character be about having to explain that their name is Na. Which brings me to my final point. Thanks to skills, any characters can be good. As time and time progresses within the Fire Emblem franchise, there's been a bigger and bigger emphasis on the characters, and Awakening is no different. Except that, in Awakening, they take it one step further by adding a ton of skills and abilities and letting a character pick and choose 5 skills, basically making every character viable or at the very least usable. To the casual fans of Fire Emblem, this was a great change as it meant that any character that they wanted to use is now usable, and the investment that they put into their favorites aren't a complete waste. But for hardcore fans of Fire Emblem, it felt like the choices in character stats and numbers were gone as the budget for power were mostly on skills like Gale Force. While I don't personally have a strong opinion on Awakening now, it's really not surprising to me at all that Awakening hits that nice middle spot for a lot of people, including myself. I find Awakening to be that game where I spend a lot of time trying to make the most absurd and broken units, and not really the title that I go to when looking for a challenge. But when brainstorming as to why Awakening would get this sort of placement, I think it's because people grew out of the series and got to explore more of what the franchise had to offer them. Every entry in the Fire Emblem series has its own unique set of mechanics that differentiates it from the rest of the batch. As the series goes on, the differences between the older and newer titles becomes more drastic, but if there's one game in the series that I believe shares the most in common with every other title, it would be Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Sword. 
Being the first FE game to be introduced to the Western world, the story of Ellawood, Lynn, and Hector has been solidified in many veterans' hearts as the quintessential FE experience. But what makes it such a great entry? Well, personally, I like to break down Fire Emblem games into five different categories. Map design, mechanics, story, visuals, and characters. And gosh darn does this game come close to nailing almost every single category. Of course, this is subjective. Many complain that the story is filled with plot holes and contrivances that make it worthy of an eye roll. But for what it's worth, I feel that Fire Emblem 7 effortlessly creates a memorable world filled with characters that the player can easily become invested into, whether they know it or not. As for the gameplay, its simplicity may make it appear to be a bit of a bore to play. Lacking skills, branching class paths, limited legendary weapons, and an endgame that seems to drag on more than it excites. But in its simplicity comes a system that allows its players to truly show off their tactical prowess. Rescue Dropping, an amazing mechanic borrowed from Thracia, allows players to do advanced strategies like trade chains, quicker map traversal, and creating choke points to name a few. But it also acts as a failsafe for players who may make a blunder and put a vulnerable unit in the path of danger. Although the con and wait system may have its issues, it does a good job of balancing the cast out and creating a set of rules that the player must follow, pushing them to be more creative with their solutions. Sure, this game may have a near-identical system to FE6, The Binding Blade, but there's one thing that FE7 improves upon greatly, and that's the maps. Dawning, in my opinion, some of the best map designs in the series, the chapters do a very good job of incentivizing players to play quickly, while also making them hesitant and applying tension. Many of these maps present the player with multiple solutions to tackle a problem, and they also create interesting ways for the unit to interact with the terrain layouts, creating vantage points, ways to flank the opponent, and shortcuts to circumnavigate sticky scenarios. And of course, this is GBA Emblem, so it goes without saying that the art style and animations are among the best in the entire series. And I'm sure you can't avoid hearing someone saying they wish the next installment would go back to sprite-based animation. Nothing gets the blood pumping quite like a critical animation that actually lets you feel the momentum of your strikes. So yes, there's a reason why when someone new to the series asks me where they should start, I always point straight to Fire Emblem 7. I feel that if you start with 7, you can get a firm understanding of what Fire Emblem's formula is all about. An experience that is challenging, memorable, and downright well-crafted, Fire Emblem 7 is a damn good entry. All right, all right, pipe down, people. You all knew this was coming. I get to review the greatest game of all time, and I'm excited about it. Except I'm actually going to try to be objective about it. Yeah, you heard me right. Objective. Now, normally I'd throw out some kind of insult at the fact that y'all gave this a 7.2, but I'm actually in a good mood today, so I'm just going to try to nicely change your mind instead. Let's get right into the elephant in the room here, the gameplay. This is where FE4 gets the majority of its criticism, and you know what? I get it. I'm actually with you here. Both the player phases and the enemy phases are long, and the maps are massive. Luckily, depending on how you're playing this game, wink wink, you can get things to move a little bit, or a lot, faster than they normally would be. But again, for the sake of being objective, I'll give you this point. However, there are only 12 chapters in total in this game, with each of them divided into castles, or segments. You also have an opportunity to save your progress and step away from the game at the start of every turn. No one is forcing you to sit down and play entire chapters in one go, and if anything, this game gives you the most flexibility to start and stop than any other Fire Emblem game. Generally, you're rarely going to even have to restart in this game for an entire chapter unless you seriously screw up your saves per turn. But the real issue is the backtracking. I know, there's a couple of very famous maps, most notoriously chapters 2 and 4, that have agonizingly long segments where you need to backtrack across an empty map to loop around to go to another location. There is a reason for this, and I'll get to that later, but it could still be remedied and tackled in a different way. Granted, this game is over 25 years old, older than most of you guys watching, most likely, so you'll have to forgive them for cramming all this into a game that is a whopping 8 megabytes in size. I wish I was kidding. The rest of the gameplay is actually fantastic. You get to manage an entire army. After all, this game is called Genealogy of the Holy War, not Genealogy of the Holy Skirmish. 
You're deploying and managing an army that is clashing against an enemy army. It's meant to be grand and large, and just like you have a lot of units to use and play with, so does the enemy. I'm also cramming this in really quickly as a one-liner, but the skill inheritance and second generation unit building and management mechanic is great and allows for some really nice replayability, so I think they deserve a point there. Some people hate the way trading works, but I think it's a fun way to really learn to manage your resources. It's not convenient, but hey, if you want easy and convenient, just go play Sacred Stones or something, I don't know. Anyways, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to explain FE4 from the perspective of its narrative genius. Without getting into too many details, this is a game where story and gameplay are integrated into one another. One of my favorite things to show is the map of FE4, and how you as the player will traverse nearly the entire continent throughout your journey. No other game in the series does this as intensively as FE4 does. As the player, you will not only experience a global conflict through the eyes of your main protagonists, but also through the on-map events between NPCs and multiple armies. This does drag on the gameplay, but it is part of the narrative. You're only playing a part in the greater plot that is going on, and while that may feel overwhelming at times, this is the trade-off between deep lore and storytelling and bland-ass gameplay simulators like Shadow Dragon. There's a reason the maps are long, and a reason the game is slow, and a reason that backtracking exists, and that's because you're walking around the world itself. Now, can it be done better? Absolutely. But like I said earlier, this game came out in 1996. Let's just say it how it is, man. I'm not going to spoil the story, because even if you know it, it's still worth exploring all the little details with the little village conversations that add to the lore and just experiencing this wonderful tale for yourself. I know this isn't a thorough review, I can't exactly craft a proper love letter to FE4 in such a short time, you can again blame Bopper for the time constraints, but in my obviously biased opinion, this is a 10 out of 10 game that everyone should experience for themselves at least once. It's going to provide you a unique Fire Emblem experience that you won't get from any other game in the series. Most of it is actually fantastic, and some of it is not so great, but either way you should all play it regardless. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a barbecue to attend at Belhalla, but I'll be back later to read some more comments to see how many people I triggered this time. Peace! I am back! Um, okay, so Conquest is my favorite of the trio, and I am Norian Scum, we can get through this, but uh, I'd like to plead my case here and prove that I'm not some kind of, like, Scandinavian war princess. I am, in fact, aware that it's bad to conquer other nations, and you can't quote me on that. But I'm actually sort of in favor of our main character doing bad things, and I'm pretty sure the game is too. I feel like I spent too much time talking about this one installment in Fire Emblem history. Like, uh, I, I do get that, so I'll be brief in that, as before, the game's strongest writing is front-loaded, blah 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 blah. I like Conquest's direction most, because it frames Korn's uh, decision on their found family not in suddenly being uncritical in favor of Daddy King Garen and colonizing the East, you know. If I seem defensive about this game, that's because I kind of am. Uh, Fates as a whole has a lot going against it, from Niles the sex criminal, to Soleil the lesbian who gets her homosexuality cured via drugs, to Elise behaving like the adult she technically is, there's an uncomfortable amount of like periphery nightmare fuel that has been discussed at length a lot. I, I don't want to pretend that there isn't. I'm here, instead, to talk about what I like. <laughs> and again, I'm not talking mechanics, though. They're pretty fun in Conquest, so there's that. So, um... Why do we write stories where good people do bad things? Like, like, am I the only one who finds the criticism of Corrin goes on a journey to conquer an entire other nation just because their family can't tell their dad is a goo monster? Like, a little insincere. Like, there's definitely a point to be made about the symbolism at play, considering the aesthetic design choices of Nor and Hoshida respectively. Like, I, I do get that. But, like, I think that going in with a highly uncharitable mindset is really only going to make Conquest's flaws a bit more potent. So come with me for a second, because I think Conquest is about abuse. Like, I know that's a bit of a stretch, but hear me out. Okay, so Xander, Camilla, Leo, and Elise are all children of a father who constantly pushes them to enact horrible violence that none of them wanted to do. And they've all, in turn, figured out a way to cope with it. Um, I mean, at least, like, most of them did. Like, I, I don't think Elise is enough for violence. Uh, Leo learned how to covertly undermine his father's orders. Camilla has uh, kind of descended into a mindset of, like, savagery for the sake of keeping her family safe. 
Xander tries to placate his father's demands. You know, Corrin can't just tell her siblings their dad clearly sucks because they have been raised to constantly recontextualize why he does the things he does. And the very premise that makes Birthright and Revelation's respective stories get off the ground is what tethers Corrin into obedience. It's a slow, painful process of trying to constantly highlight Garen's worst offenses to Corrin that happen right in front of the family's eyes, over and over. Like, it reaches the point where Azura pro uh, proposes that the only way they'll see him for what he truly is is if he takes the Hoshiram throne and turn to goo. And the killer part of this is that this line of thought kind of comes through more than the game's sloppy writing really should be able to deliver. Like, the Nor babies are all constantly quick to your defense over and over and over, like, able to butt heads with more profusely with Hans, with Solo, with Iago, but when their father is giving the orders, they all kind of buckle because his word has been law their entire lives. Corrin has to pull and tug and peel back everything about Garen until all that remains is the rotten core of his heart. It's a task so mon monumental to help pull a victim out of an abuse situation like this that it really does feel like you have to go to war with half the world just to get through to them. Does this excuse it? Like, all of it? The, like, the heartbreak, the devastation on people who don't deserve it? No, and I don't think the game says that it should. Like, honestly, Korn constantly talks to Azura, stressing at length over feeling like they're cutting their own heart out of their chest, that they're turning into a monster just like their father. It's gut-wrenching for the young royal, inflicting so much harm on people who wanted them to come home instead. And Garen, Hans, Yago, they're all working to exacerbate that, to, to keep twisting the knife. The game wants you to feel bad that you're doing this, and the cathartic pleasure of the story is watching Corrin commit to the act anyway, to keep pushing themselves forward. And that's a compelling bit of drama, and that's kind of why I like it. <laughs> Out of all the GBA titles that the Fire Emblem franchise had to offer, Sacred Stones was voted in as one of the best. And honestly, to no one's surprise. Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones is the final entry to the GBA series and also the game with the most amount of visual polish. There's a lot of things that Sacred Stones did right as a game and that's probably the reason as to why it was voted in so highly on this list. I think the first thing that comes into many people's minds, including myself, when it comes to remembering Sacred Stones, is the roster of characters. I think it's safe to say that Sacred Stones has one of the best rosters that this series has to offer, and I think that's all due in part to the excellent writing that most of the support conversations are when it comes to building up their characters. Even non-playable characters like Valter get a ton of exposition in how he becomes the sadistic wyvern writer that we know him as today. But besides the incredible roster, Sacred Stones is also the Fire Emblem game that introduces a lot of the innovative mechanics that we see in modern Fire Emblem games today, like branch promotion paths. Being able to customize your unit's promotions gave the game a ton of room to experiment and tinker. Are you struggling with bringing your Natasha to the later parts of the game because of her low movement? Well, why not try out Valkyrie Natasha so she can move around the map alongside your front line? You want to make an entire army of great knights? Go right ahead. Sacred Stones offered that flexibility, and that was really innovative for its time. And speaking of branched paths, Sacred Stones took a lot of inspiration from Guidance Tool protagonists, but instead made it so that you follow one of the twins specifically instead of flip-flopping between the two between chapters. This approach added a ton of extra content and extra room to explore the same character but in a different light like Leon, who presents himself differently depending on which of the routes you take. Finally, Sacred Stones added a true post-game type of content that was much more difficult than the actual game in the form of both the Tower of Volney and the Logdo Ruins. By doing multiple runs to the towers and ruins, you're rewarded after beating the final boss with a ton of secret characters, the bosses that you fought along the way. While I personally think they should have kept both the tower and ruin locked away until you truly do beat the final boss, having a challenge after the main game so you can continue to build supports and use your favorite characters was a great idea. However, despite all the flexibility and extra content, I think the biggest reason as to why Sacred Stones didn't land any higher on people's favorites list is because of its difficulty. Thanks to a few bugs that led to promoted units having worse stats than pre-promoted units, 
both the tower and the rune to grind the XP in, and the overall short amount of chapters that this game has to offer, the game wasn't difficult or challenging unless you put some sort of restriction on yourself. Personally, while I do wish the game was a bit more difficult, I think the rest of the game has aged well over the years. The characters are still as strong as I remember them being from my first playthrough, and it's fun seeing how many great knights I could make just for the hell of it. Therefore, making the placement of Sacred Stones at number 6 somewhat fair if it wasn't for recency bias towards certain titles that you'll see later down the list. I am Zetetic, again. I'm not surprised to see that Fire Emblem Thracia 776 ended up just barely in the top 5 in the poll conducted by Professor Gallup, but an average score of 7.78? How could you screw this one up? I'm so disappointed. As a player of video games, anything to avoid calling myself a gamer, Thracia is a genuinely fun game. As someone with a keen interest in game design as, dare I say, an art form, Thracia is a nightmare. Warp tiles, getting obscure items, recruiting certain characters, unlocking certain guidance chapters by knowing which bosses to hug until the end of the chapter. Most of these things were not even originally hinted at in game. You just have to know them somehow, and if you don't know, well, fuck you then. In a 1990 Famitsu interview with Shouzo Kaga, he was asked how he felt about a critique of the first Fire Emblem game. Basically, a bunch of nerds complained that FE1 was not strategic enough. Kaga had this to say. Well, that is an understandable response from the perspective of hardcore strategy buffs and those who design games with them primarily in mind, but for Nintendo-made products the baseline for the development is always that it be easy to play in the end, something anyone can pick up and enjoy. Frankly though, I think Kaga was always the hardcore strategy nerd who thought his own games were too easy, but Nintendo, damn them, they were forcing him to make easy games. So he started making his games more and more complex. Gracia was his greatest anti-Nintendo game in that regard, a game you literally cannot play to the end if you don't have enough characters and or door keys. Then he had to make his own game studio just to get the goddamn hidden ballista chapter he clearly always wanted to make, but Mario wouldn't ever let him. What Thracia mainly owes, it's fun too, is the community that has worked hard to pull back some of the needless mystery about the game. Whether it's through patches like Lil Manster that provide clear translations, add more explanatory text, and improve the UI, or spoiler-free guides like Mecha's video that warn you about things you might miss, to prepare you ahead of time, Gracia is more playable than it ever was. The game still has its fair share of surprises, which is good for a strategy game, but now those surprises feel more intentional and less outright disrespectful of the player's time. All of that is not to say that Thracia is entirely unplayable without a guide the first time through, but in my first blind playthrough of the game, I felt like a lot was missing from it. You know, because of how much of the game I literally missed. Had my first playthrough been with a guide, it probably would be my favorite Fire Emblem game. The design of the game's maps and units is probably among the best of any game in the series, and the story is quite enjoyable as a mid of FE4. The capture mechanic is fun to use, and it's too bad there isn't anything quite like it in the series. If not for the game's reliance on guided play, it would be the perfect Fire Emblem game. But Thracia is purposefully designed around being an inaccessible mess, and that annoys me. So, in short, I think Thracia deserves the score it got, though I dock a couple of hundreds of a point for memes. Hey, Bopheads, it's Patrick. And Danny. A Barbie gamer. Fire Emblem Three Houses, aka Fire Emblem Go, is the most recent entry in the series, so it's not really a surprise seeing it towards the top of the series ranking list. It's a great entry point for those who are looking to get into the series, and it really expands on some of the series staples, like great crit animations. The pick your team multiple playthrough approach really expands on what was seen in Fates, and you don't have to buy a completely different game in order to see it. Choose between House Valor, House Mystic, and the one with Lysithia. I don't tend to make time to replay games, but I didn't mind it this time around as the different paths were varied enough that you do feel like you're getting a different experience. This was likely due to the smaller and drastically different squads. I honestly think this is why the game is ranked so highly on this list. Each character is very visible throughout the course of the story, as opposed to most of the other entries where a unit doesn't get many lines beyond recruitment. You get to know each house's core group intimately through all the pre and post mission scenes. Personalities, for better or worse, looking at you Bernadetta, really shine through, 
The amount of time you spend with these characters goes a long way and is amplified with the professor mechanic. I would argue that this is the other major reason the game ranks so highly. There is simply a greater level of customization in this game compared to the rest. Do you want a net to smack people with an axe instead of being the cannon mage? Sure, go ahead. Want to change Raphael into a brawler so that he can show off them meaty thighs? I highly encourage it. You're completely unrestricted in how you develop your characters, and that's great. Three Houses' biggest strength lies in the teaching role immersing you so intimately in each squad. Whether they're an annoying playboy noble like Lawrence or an annoying playboy noble like Sylvain, these characters are likable. You spend a lot of time getting to know these characters, and that's more than any other game in the series can say. So yeah, aside from this game being at the forefront of people's minds due to it being the most recent release, all of these major factors leads to this entry having the best series unit feel. That's not to say this is a perfect entry. There are a few things that hold it back from the games yet to come on this list, as well as a few things that make its fourth place ranking questionable. While the game's easier difficulty may make it more approachable for newcomers to the series, it may seem a tad off-putting for veterans. I understand the use of the Divine Pulse feature. Many players of the series are used to restarting a map that they've spent a decent chunk of time on so they don't lose one of their favorite units. For those of you that don't want to start a map over from the beginning, this feature is for you. But in my experience, my characters were always at a good level. It was rare if I ever lost anyone in a fight. Even on hard mode, I would save the Divine Pulse for characters that may have missed their attack on the enemy. Or maybe just to rewatch those crit animations. The Divine Pulse feature also points out another glaring fault in the difficulty of this game, the de-incentivization of permadeath. Isn't it ironic to think of permadeath as an incentive? It is one of the staples of the Fire Emblem series, and although I understand some don't want to deal with the frustrations of losing their favorite allies, they not only give you one but two options to deal with this, both the Divine Pulse and Casual Mode. If you have one, why would you need the other? You're basically incentivized not to commit to your poor choices because your roster of characters in the first half of the game is the bulk of your team. Unlike other entries in the series, you're never really given those strong replacement characters later down the line. Can you imagine playing Blazing Blade and not getting any units in the second half? Goodbye, Pent and Louise, but it's okay. We already have Urk and Rebecca. No. The only other feature that stands out as a potential issue is the teaching mechanic, or perhaps the monastery in general. At the start of the game, it's pretty fun. Finding lost items, training at the dojo, sharing meals with friends. It starts out as feeling very persona, but in a good way. Trying to balance the quiet teaching life with the ongoing struggles of the lands outside your somewhat quiet little monastery. But because there are so many ways to gain this experience, by the time skip, my characters had most of the classes, supports, and skills I wanted them to have. I found myself skipping the monastery altogether and just utilizing the auto-teaching feature or the lecture. I think it suits the student phase of the game because it shows the student's growth, but it kind of breaks up the flow of the narrative in the second half. Other games like Path of Radiance balance the downtime a lot better by offering just enough. Three Houses' fourth place spot is probably right, but it could easily be debated. Yes, if you're a series purist, you might not enjoy the more hands-on mechanics. They can really cause the game to drag. However, the character development truly makes for a stellar experience, and this game has, bar none, the most content in any game in the series. Oh, and the boys are hot. The top three are now upon us, and that's a good time to shout out all the people that help make this channel possible. If it wasn't for the generous support of viewers over on Patreon and here on YouTube memberships, I wouldn't be able to keep up with the channel as much as I have. If you like this video, and you want to see more like it, as well as get access to other perks, consider subscribing to Patreon by following the link in the description. Two kingdoms, both alike in dignity and fair Valencia where we make our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers raise their flags, whose separate journeys bring them together, doth with their victory bury their people's strife. 
the fearful passage of their war-torn love, and the continuance of their idol's rage, which, but their children's love, not could remove, is how the few minutes traffic of our screen, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Hopefully the iambic pentameter worked out there. Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valencia released in 2017 for the Nintendo 3DS and is a remake of the NES game Fire Emblem Gaiden. Despite the somewhat awkward timing of being a 3DS title while the Nintendo Switch was just starting to take off, Echoes was a more than welcome addition to the series for many reasons. The biggest reason being the prior entry, or entries I guess in the series, Fire Emblem Fates having a less than stellar reputation in the fanbase. I'll defer to Vivian on that front since I've never actually played them, but I don't need to have played them to know that those games are not well liked. Even today, two thirds of the Fates games got dragged through this very power ranking, while Echoes is sitting in the top three. People were certainly hyped for this game, myself included. Echoes was the first ever Fire Emblem game that I would be on the ground floor for as a fan of the series. It just looked so cool. The art design was fantastic, the story seemed serious, and wow, there were even dungeons. What a cool idea, right? I got Echoes the day it came out, even splurging for the special edition. Well, oh, fuck it, I even got the Amiibos too. I was all in on Echoes. Then I played it. I'm playing it. I'm playing it. I'm playing it. Then one day, I just stopped. I got to a map on Alm side and I just couldn't win without some sort of major casualty, so I put the game down and I didn't pick it back up until a few months ago, a little bit before my Binding Blade playthrough. I had come down with a certain illness that I'm unclear whether YouTube still flags videos over for even mentioning. Uh, it kept me uh, bedridden for a couple of weeks, so in between binging YouTube streams of Bopper playing Thracia, I finally finished Echoes after not touching it for almost three years. That has to be the longest hiatus I ever took to beat a game. But I'm glad I didn't drop this game permanently because I did quite like it, despite some glaring flaws. I'll go over the flaws as fast as I can since they've been talked to death, but it still wouldn't feel right if I didn't bring them up. First off, those maps. Fuck man. I was never really good at discerning what is and isn't a good map in these games, but I know for sure that these maps are, as a group, not good. Most don't even really have much design to speak of unless you count open fields as design. The less said about the swamps, the better. I don't know if any map in the game really even stood out to me. I, I suppose I like the map where you fight Emperor Rudolph, but it's not because of the map design, it's because of the unique AI the Emperor has to complement the story. Speaking of the story, I, I also have some problems with that. It tries to contrast the lengths Alm and Celica, the, those star-crossed lovers from earlier, go to achieve peace between the warring countries of Regal and Zofia. And for the most part, this is done well. It's only when the story begins to reach its climax do Celica's choices start to get on my nerves. I guess it's Fire Emblem tradition that the bad guys have to be over-the-top cackling hunchbacks and robes, but I think adding a little more nuance to the servants of Duma would have gone a long way in beginning to empathize with their decision to trick Celica the way they do. Take, for example, Brakut. His story is excellent and is colored by shades of gray. I didn't exactly agree with what he did, but I completely understand how he ended up how he did. Almside in general seems to be more well executed. I just wish it didn't come at the cost of Celica's character, which I feel it does. As for critique, those are the only major ones I have. Everything else is firing on all cylinders. I'm not surprised that Echoes is so high up on the popularity poll. Hidari's artwork for Fire Emblem is second only to Sachiko Wada's, and I'd love it if they could get him back someday. And while I have faults with some decisions made by characters near the final hours, I found the character writing to be excellent overall. There aren't nearly as many supports as other Fire Emblems, but there also aren't any supports that left me with less than they took, either. Some of my personal favorites are Clive and Matilda's, which basically amounts to how much they love each other due to their wants and bloodlust. I'm only half joking. Leon and Valbar's, which is probably the first time the series ever treated a gay character with a modicum of respect. And then there's Alm and Faze, which feels like it could be some sort of commentary on shipping culture with the latter experiencing an unrequited love for the former. 
In any other Fire Emblem game with supports, this would probably end in a romance, but since this is Echoes and it has a story to tell involving Alm, it ends with a gentle rejection. I appreciate that Echo sticks to its guns like that, and I think that's part of the reason everyone else likes this game too. It was such a stark contrast to the previous titles on the 3DS, and showed veterans that the series wasn't irreparably changed into a waifu dating sim where you touch people's faces in a hot spring. But that's a review for another day and another time that I'm not going to make because I never fucking played that game. Okay, so I feel like it's not a scalding take to say that there's a lot of good stuff going on in Radiant Dawn, and I get to be vindicated uh, after the fact because I wrote most of the script before the rankings came in, and we're in number two, baby! Let's go! Okay, so there are furries in it, uh, there's a ton of queer coding all over the place, and it does something pretty interesting in the series by starting you from the perspective of the country that lost the war in the previous title. Micaiah, the Maiden of Dawn, runs an eerily similar parallel in reviving Dayan from a brutal occupation from Benyon, uh, the big empire that like helped you in the war in the last game. And then Radiant Dawn changes perspectives a few times to help contextualize this conflict spread out between like a huge cast of sympathetic characters. That's excellent character drama. Like, I, I don't think I've lost anyone so far. However, where a lot of tension around RD starts to come up is in Act 4, where following the collision of pretty much every major party in question in one massive, aesthetically fantastic chapter, like there's, there's a blue number that raises with every death on any side, and, and the pulsing sound gets louder and louder, and some characters are forced to leave the battlefield. It's so good! Um, people kind of feel a bit shafted that the final act kind of pulls a big hand wave to the complex problems leading up to this massive battle by turning most of the world to stone, and I do feel for that perspective a lot, because I frankly love Micaiah, she's great, and her role in Act 4 is basically just to be the voice of the goddess Yune, so, like, sh she's barely in the actual conclusion of a story that was framed explicitly from her perspective for the first half of, ga of the game in order, you know, to make Ike the big main character again, uh, and, and, you know, have him attack and dethrone God, so great, fine. Uh, now, of course, this is me. And it is my duty and my pleasure to go all in and defend what I think really works in Act 4 of Radiant Dawn. So, um, so if we can look past the minor contrivances to bring everyone together and watch the journey everyone makes, there's a lot of really great moments where the cast all have to grapple with the kind of absurd world they live in now. Like, they have survived a total apocalypse. And at the same time, there are a lot of characters that comment on how weirdly good it feels. And that's actually kind of a scary thought to consider especially for a series like fucking Fire Emblem to prod at. Like, like the Herons missed Alencia, a lot of them remark that the world has an almost eerie peacefulness to it. And and also part of why it's so jarring when Ashura summons soldiers out of nowhere to fight you. You know, look, I honestly feel like if part four was longer and had committed more to leaning into the kind of bizarre horror of fighting the literal goddess of order, uh, there could be a lot of really inventive, fun chapters that aren't the massive slugfests of enemies they throw at you to make sure that, you know, Soth, Soth? Soth? And Ike and, so and Sonaki actually gain some semblance of, like, meaningful experience. Getting to the Tower, itself a finale in multiple parts, does feel a bit clumsy, but it is also the culmination of the kind of massive scope Radiant Dawn is going for, so, you know, they're kind of right to put out, like, all the big bad guys in one spot and knock them out one um, after the other. I personally don't super like that Ike's the main character again, I already said that. Um, it's like a cool enough fight, the, the one with Black Knight, but it's a little frustrating that we open the game on such an interesting dynamic, um, only to collapse in on itself and just retread Ike's unproblematic journey to save the world and racism and collect one of two boyfriends. I, I mean goals, I guess. But I still really like this game. It, it's maybe my favorite in the entire series, because while the support system sucks, while there's just not a lot of love for the newer additions to the cast, I can't help but you know, feel for, for Micaiah. And it's not just because she's a girl boss out there living while under contract to kill cat girls, but it's for its little moments. You know, the quiet panic you get to see Micaiah go through trying to keep Soth alive. Uh, to see Alencia get crushed by, um, wait, was his name like Ludovico or something? That doesn't sound right. Um, the special battle log, ba battle log, battle dialogue, the special battle dialogue between Astrid and Lacan, the, the, the heartbreak of Almeida, who's, who's been straight garbage to you all game, uh, when her son dies, like, I don't know. 
If anything, I should be more frustrated that the game really had a hold of something, uh, of like getting to show us multiple angles in a horrible war only to stumble at the finish line, but I feel for it, I guess. Oh, also, um, if anyone out there is listening and they, you have to talk about Fire Emblem for money on the internet, the original English voiceover pronounced it Kyaneus and Yune. So if you're worried that the internet thinks you're swearing, it's Kyaneus. Please don't listen to Fire Emblem Heroes. And also, it, it has to be Yune. Like, that. that's, that's how the name works. <laughs> Out of the 22 Fire Emblem games on this ranking poll, it's no surprise that FE9, Path of Radiance, is at the top of the mountain. If I had to describe a near-perfect Fire Emblem game to someone, Path of Radiance is what instantly comes to mind. Amazing world building, character designs, writing, storytelling, extremely serviceable map design and mechanics, and units that just feel amazingly fun to level up and customize with skills on every playthrough. But speedy, Radiant Dawn takes everything that Path of Radiance did, but makes it better. Well, where Path of Radiance has the edge is by having a laminar chapter flow that lets the player really feel like they're following their unit's journeys from beginning to end. Sure, its system is a bit simplified compared to Radiant Dawn's, and it does feel way less epic in the end, but as an all-around experience, Path of Radiance has a more universal appeal than its sequel. P.O.R. can be credited for so many innovations in the franchise, with some fresh ideas that I really wish would make a return. Positional skills like shove and smite and weapon forging are mechanics that debuted with this title and are frequently featured in Fire Emblem entries to this day. The Lagoos, shape-shifting units that introduced a new class that actually alters the way tacticians utilize them. Base conversations that not only made the player feel like they were a tactician preparing for war, but it seamlessly injected character and world building that made this game's universe and its inhabitants feel like they could plausibly exist. And I can confidently say that there is no better incentive to play a map quickly than bonus EXP, a mechanic that I think should definitely make a return to the franchise. In Path of Radiance, it makes the game a little bit easy, but with some fine-tuning, I strongly believe that it's one of the best gameplay rewards that just feels so fun to use. Bringing back skill books that were last seen in FE5 allowed map designers to also create incentives for their players to take risks that actually felt exciting and worth it. And being able to customize your units with unique skills is not only fun, but gives some great replay value to the title. It has its issues, like every entry on this list, and every game in existence. Its gameplay pace can feel a bit dragged on because of clunky battle and map animations, enemy phases can feel like they take forever, the battle screen when animations are on doesn't show damage, hit rate, and critical calculations that have been beloved for many years, and the game's difficulties vary from too easy to unfun if you're playing on Maniac. But outside of these, you have a game that actually feels like there was thought put behind it. Its polish, nuanced characters, and gameplay formula really set the standard for what we should be getting in an FE title. And if intelligent systems were ever to try to emulate what Path of Radiance did, with some quality of life refinement and innovations from Radiant Dawn, we would definitely get a banger of a game. So thank you for existing. I'll never forget my adventures with Ike and Alincia, my showdowns with the Black Knight, my love of the characters, your believable world, your ever enjoyable mechanics, but most importantly, thank you, Path of Radiance. I'm so glad you were made, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. And there you have it. The top 10 Fire Emblem games as voted by fans. This video was an immense undertaking, and it wouldn't have been possible without the contributions from all the voices you've heard throughout these two parts. Check out all their channels down in the description and go subscribe to them. As well, I want to know how this compares to your top 10, and why everybody else is wrong. Goodbye, and I'll see you soon.